And so on the 10th of May 1940, Germany has 135 divisions available on the Western Front, but they are going to have to face 151 British, French, Belgian and Dutch divisions. The German army is short of ammunition and fuel. They had 7,378 artillery pieces, whereas the French army alone have 10,700. Together, the Allies have over 14,000 pieces of artillery to face this German onslaught of just over 7,000. The French have one third more tanks than the Germans do, and many of those tanks, like the S-35, are technically superior to the tanks the Germans have. The Allies also have more aircraft on the Western Front. And so with their massive superiority in equipment, then surely Britain and France will be able to hold in the West. The Germans cannot possibly hope to win a long war against the vast British and French empires. And Germany, with its economy struggling under the impact of blockade, had already been forced to beg from its ally Italy, copper. Now, Italy is a resource poor nation and to find the copper to be able to give to the Germans, Mussolini had, had to strip copper pans out of houses and copper out of churches. But Germany had needed this copper to produce enough ammunition for one offensive. Germany has just enough ammunition for one big gamble in the West. It will all be decided in the summer of 1940. Either they can break Britain and France on the Western Front in 1940, or they will surely lose the war. And so if they cannot win quickly, they cannot win at all. Initially, the Germans had planned for an advance through Belgium, but over the winter, that plan had changed to a new plan concocted by the generals Guderian and Manstein. The advance into Belgium with this new plan will just be a feint. They know that the British and French are expecting the German army to try and smash through Belgium. And so they will feint an, adv an advance into Belgium, while Army Group A will instead be the deadly thrust. It will attempt to smash through the French lines in the heavily forested Ardennes region. And having broken the French front, they will then attempt to race for the coast, the English Channel, to trap the British and French armies in Belgium. There, out of supply and surrounded, they will be destroyed. And so the Germans want the British and French armies to advance deep into Belgium so that they can be trapped. We have here a map of the situation of Europe in the winter of 1939. Now the plan, and it's a bold gamble, the plan depends on the leadership of Rundstedt and Kleist, the field marshals in charge of the German assault on the West. But both these leaders are cautious. They also have real doubts over the viability of the plan and neither really understand tank or panzer tactics, but they outrank the architects of the plan, Guderian and Manstein. And so, Guderian and Manstein will not be in charge of the plan that they themselves have come up with. Instead, Rundstedt and Kleist, with their serious doubts about this plan, will be the ones who have to put the plan into effect. It's hardly the best of starts for the Germans. Now, the Ardennes region of France is also an incredibly challenging one for a modern army to advance through. It's only got a handful of roads to cope with what's going to be a mass of vehicles attempting to pour through this very narrow wooded area. Army Group A, if it's to manage this surprise thrust into the heart of France, will have to cross the Luxembourg barrier defences. It'll have to cross the Belgian fortification line. It'll have to cross the River Semur. It'll have to also cross the French border fortifications. Now, none of these barriers are actually that formidable. Yes, they are all weak defensive lines, but any delay, any delay at all to this plan could be fatal to the German assault. And while Army Group A is attempting to win the conflict with this bold thrust, Army Group B would drive into Belgium in attempts to suck the French and British armies in to support 
the assaulted Belgians. And so with that German plan, how are the French planning to respond to this attack? We have here a map of, we saw last week in fact, French plans for the advance into Belgium. Now, Gamelin, the field marshal in charge of the French army, he's expecting a German attack on Belgium. The French army, however, had not been allowed to advance into Belgium early because the Belgians, remember, had cancelled their alliance with France. And when a Belgian field marshal had got too friendly with the French, he would got sacked. And so Belgium had refused permission for the French army to advance into Belgium ahead of time before the German assault. And so the French army is lined up along the Belgian border and defending the Maginot Line. Now, on that border, on the French-Belgian border, the French army had dug in and prepared defences. And they could simply sit on that border. Gamelin was aware that just because the Germans were attacking Belgium, that did not mean the French army had to advance into Belgium. He knew that they could refuse to advance into Belgium, but to do so would mean abandoning the Belgians and the Dutch. And their armies could be useful in a long war. Also, it would mean that it, France would once again be a battlefield. And after the devastation of the trenches of the First World War, Gamelin is desperate to make sure that the war is conducted somewhere, anywhere, except for in France. And so therefore he decides that when the Germans attack Belgium, the French and British armies will advance into Belgium to meet them somewhere in Belgium. But where? Because there are three possibilities that we discussed last week. He could go with what was known as Plan E, the least ambitious, most cautious of the plans. And if you look at the E plan, the ESCO hypothesis, then you'll advance to save Ghent to make sure that places like Lille are kept away from the fighting. It would protect Ghent and the Belgian coastline and it would save some of the Belgian army. The Belgian army would undoubtedly be broken by the Germans in the fighting on the frontiers and the battle for Brussels, but the shattered red, uh, remnants of the Belgian army would be able to retreat to join the British and French along the river Escaux. However, most of the front would still be on the French border, and so he was reluctant to go with Plan E. Then you have Plan D, the Dial Plan. Now this calls for a quicker advance, and it would take more French and British troops to be able to achieve it. But it would have a number of advantages over Plan E. It would save Brussels, and it would also mean that they protected most of the Belgian industrial production. And so most of Belgium's industrial resources would be continuing to work for the Allies' war effort, rather than going to feed the German war effort. This, of course, would be a huge advantage. Now, French armoured forces would have to be used to concentrate on what's known as the Gembleau Gap. If you look on your maps at that white line, follow the white line down the river Dial, through Levain, through Vevre, and then you see the gap between the rivers Dial and the river Sambre. This is the Gembleau Gap. This is the bit of weakness on the Dial line. Here there is no river line to defend, and Gaiman expected the Germans, therefore, to make for that gap. And so if they went for the Plan Z, they would concentrate the French armoured forces on this Gambleau Gap to try and hold it. There was also known something known as the Breeder variant of the D plan. Now this involved pushing an extra 15 divisions up to Breeder in the Netherlands. And you can see it on the map there, just south of Rotterdam. And so instead of just going for the Dial plan or the D plan, they could gamble. They could gamble with the strategic reserve, the soldiers that have been kept back to deal with emergencies or unexpected events, and they could throw them north towards Breda. Now, why might they do so? Why would they use their 15 reserve divisions to push up to Breda? Well, it would help save Antwerp. The key port of Antwerp would be in Allied hands, not German, and it would allow them to rescue the Dutch army and to protect the islands that make up the Dutch coast. Now it's far riskier. This is a big gamble, much riskier plan, and it would use up all the British and French mobile reserves. 
So if they went for the for the for the Greedo variant, and the Germans broke broke through somewhere unexpected on, on on the line, there would be no reserve units to be able to react to this breakthrough. So it would be a big gamble, and might not even be a necessary gamble when we consider the superiority of the British and French industrial resources over that of Germany's. However, it would mean that when the war on the West broke down into trench warfare, if the war broke down in the West into trench warfare, then the Allies would be in a much stronger position over the Germans, having saved that Dutch army and even more industrial resources from the German advance. Now, the French and British, it's important to know, are convinced that Germany was stronger than it actually was. Germany certainly appeared very strong. Poland, Denmark and most of Norway had already fallen. And so, although we can see with hindsight, with that wonderful benefit of hindsight, that the British and French generals do not need to gamble on the breeder variant. Gamelin is not so sure. Gamelin believes the German propaganda images of its modern, well-equipped armed forces and it, the success of the German economy. He is convinced that Germany is much, much stronger than it is. He has no idea of the economic weaknesses that are at the heart of the German war economy. And so he's desperate, desperate to get any advantage he can for a long war. Now, this is going to sound strange, but Gamelin is also a very cautious general. His entire career has been one of caution. They might think, therefore, there is no way he would go for the breeder variant. Naturally, he would go for plan E. At the very most, he would gamble on plan D. You'd think there'd be no way that he would go for the breeder variant. But because he's a cautious general, he can't imagine an opposing general taking any kind of risk. And so he tries to put himself into the German shoes. Would they come? through the thick defences of the Maginot Line. Not a chance, because surely to launch a major offensive through the Maginot Line is to see the German army broken and destroyed in front of those fortifications and the war lost. So they would clearly not go through Maginot. He also could not believe that anybody would risk sending the main offensive through the Ardennes region. He knew that it was possible, but I know that people here school textbooks talking about the fact that the French believed it was impossible. No, they, they knew that it was possible. But they also knew that there would be a huge gamble on those few roads. And Gamelin could not believe that anybody in their right mind would take such a risk. So surely going through Belgium is the obvious choice. And if the Germans are going through Belgium with their main offensive, then it suddenly starts to make sense to go for the breeder variant, to push all the best of the French and British armies into Belgium and up into the Netherlands to gain the biggest advantages they can in any long war. Because surely they wouldn't need those reserves anywhere but in Belgium. They certainly wouldn't need them to cover the Ardennes gap around Sedan. And so, although Gamelin is cautious, that, mere, that very caution means that on the biggest decision of his life, he might, when contemplating what plan to go for, start to consider the possibility of the breeder variant. And so, France, however, at this time, is already locked into a political crisis. Now, Reynard, Prime Minister of France, had already replaced Daladier. Daladier was the Prime Minister who had taken France into the war. However, he'd been replaced by Paul Renard. Renard has only recently become prime minister, but Daladier had remained as minister of war. Now, Renard is convinced that Gamelin, Maurice Gamelin, is incapable of leading the French army into battle. And he blames Gamelin for the French inactivity during the Norway campaign. But Daladier had always protected Gamelin. Gamelin was Daladier's man. Reynard had tried to energise the French war effort, but was constantly being frustrated at every turn. The British are also in a political crisis. Now, the government of Chamberlain had been 
fatally weakened, forced out after the disastrous handling of the Norway campaign. The choice to replace Neville Chamberlain as British Prime Minister falls to a choice between Churchill and Halifax. Now, Churchill was substantially to blame for the failures of the British in the Norway campaign, and he's seen as a maverick. He, his reputation had been tarnished by the First World War Gallipoli campaign, and his reputation had been further tarnished by his actions during the 1926 general strike when he'd considered using tanks against British strikers. He had also further damaged his reputation with his support for King Edward VIII during the abdication crisis. But he has energy, he has military experience. He has served in India, the Sudan and South Africa. And of course, he'd also fought in the trenches of the First World War. But the favorite to replace Chamberlain is Lord Halifax. He's hugely experienced and a former viceroy of India, but he's also a member of the House of Lords. And there is a question of whether it's appropriate. It is constitutionally OK for the prime minister at this stage to be a member of the Lords, not the Commons, but it would have been constitutionally unusual. He also has no military experience and critically, Halifax doesn't want the job. Indeed, the very thought of being prime minister at this time made him physically sick. And so on the 10th of May, that fateful day when we start our talk, Reynard offered his resignation as Prime Minister of France after just seven weeks in office. The, his, all his efforts to replace Gamelin had been blocked by Daladier and his, uh, his Reynard's response had been either Gamelin goes or I go and Daladier had therefore really suggested that it was Reynard's turn to go. However, that day, the Germans attack in the West. And as soon as Reynard is told of the attack on the West, he withdraws his resignation. Now those three men, Reynard, Daladier and Gamelin, are going to have to work together to stop the Germans. The French command is already in disarray at this key moment, however as a new layer of command had been introduced into the French army between Gamelin and General Georges, commander of the Northeast Front. They called this extra layer of leadership GHQ Land Forces. To create it, they'd taken staff officers away from Gamelin and George's command, breaking up teams that had become used to working together and creating an extra, unnecessary, highly bureaucratic layer of command. And so at 10 minutes past five, German paratroops land in Belgium and they start to seize key fortifications and bridges. The Dutch army is ill-equipped to try and stop them. The Dutch army have no tanks, little artillery, and most of the Dutch army is made up of reservists. The Belgian army is better equipped than the Dutch army. But remember, their commander in chief had recently been sacked for being too pro-British and French and too hostile to the Germans, and they had not yet managed to bed in the replacement. And so there is chaos in the upper command of the Belgian army, just like there is in the French army, of all the times to cause this chaos in command. The Dutch Air Force was destroyed on the ground while the units defending the two key bridges in the Netherlands over, and I must apologise for the pronunciation, what are known as the Dreindrecht bridges, which are just north of Breda near Rotterdam. The bridges between Breda and Rotterdam, those critical bridges for the Dutch to hold, they had deployed troops to guard those bridges from any kind of attack. However, when the German paratroopers attacked those bridges, the Dutch soldiers found that they had not yet been issued with ammunition. And so although there were Dutch soldiers there, they were completely powerless to stop the Germans from seizing the bridges. German paratroopers also managed to seize the key Belgian fortress of Eben Amal. And we have here the fortress of Eben Amal by an incredibly daring glan uh, glider landing onto the very roof of the fortification. Army Group B enters Belgium, while Army Group A 
starts its race through the yard then. The advance is to be covered by 1,500 German bombers and 1,000 German fighters. Now on paper, the Luftwaffe could call upon 5,446 planes, but this is paper strength only. Most of those aircraft simply aren't workable, they aren't operational, or they're obsolete. And so although the paper strength is 5,446 planes, in reality, the Luftwaffe can only put 2,500 aircraft into the offensive, but it is still an intimidating force. To oppose this air armada, the area, the RAF have 500 combat ready aircraft ready to fight over the front and the French have 900. Ah, only 1,400 in total, you say. But the French had kept most of their aircraft back. The French were convinced that any attack in the West would begin, as the Germans had in Poland, with the Germans attacking airfields and trying to destroy aircraft on the ground. So they, the French had kept 1,700 aircraft back deployed behind the lines, ready to move forward once the critical battle began. So although they've only got 1,400 initially to face the 2,500 of the Germans, there are those extra 1,700 French aircraft to call upon. Told of the German attack into Belgium, Gamelin now has to make this fateful decision of which plan to go for. Would he go for plan E? Would he go for plan D? Will he go for the breeder variant? Now, Plan D is favoured. It's an 80 mile advance with 10 French and five British divisions. The breeder variant would mean those extra 15 French divisions being used. It's the French 7th Armée, their entire strategic reserve. And remember, it would link up with the Dutch as well as the Belgian armies, but would be gambling everything on the Belgian invasion being the main German thrust. At that fateful hour, Gamelin makes his choice. He will go for the breeder variant. The race to breeder is on. Although, of course, the bridges just north of breeder have already fallen to German paratroopers as the Dutch army had, been not, had not been issued with ammunition. At 10.20 a.m. on that first day of the campaign, the BEF, the British Army, enter Belgium. The French, British, Belgian and Dutch air forces are struggling to get involved into the conflict as they have no coordinated air defence system. There is no radar or ground controllers to direct the French air effort. When they are scrambled, they often struggle to find German aircraft in the sky, as after all, the sky is a big place, even with so many thousands of aircraft. The Dutch air force destroyed on the ground, and on the 10th of May, the RAF lose 74 planes to the Germans and the French lose 75 aircraft. But even on that first day, with the Germans having the advantage of surprise and the advantage of numbers over the front, the Germans take horrible losses in the air. Germany loses 192 fighters and bombers and another 244 transport aircraft. These are truly staggering losses. If the British and French can hold, then the Luftwaffe will surely be broken by the campaign. By the 12th, Army Group B has linked up with the German paratroopers and has already crossed the Albert Canal in Belgium. The Dutch army has been beaten in the space of two days and is already retreating towards Rotterdam. The French forces race into Breda have been forced back by the Germans back towards Antwerp. The British and French had lost the race to Breda in two days. On the 13th of May, the Germans have reached the Dutch coast and the Belgian army has started to fall back towards the River Dial to join up with the British and French troops. But the British and French troops who are advancing through Belgium have been delayed again and again by huge columns of refugees streaming away from the German army. Now the British and French are slowed by these refugees, the Germans are not, for the Germans think nothing of using aircraft to clear roads by machine gunning refugees to get them out of the way. The British and French obviously won't do that to the people they're advancing to protect. But it does mean that by the 13th of May, 
just three days into the campaign, the British and French have already abandoned the plan of reaching Breda and have now decided to fortify along the dial, Plan D. But the 7th Armée, the reserves, have already been sucked into Belgium. So we have here pictures of the refugees slowing the British and French in their race to the dial. Meanwhile, Army Group A has, as Guderian predicted, got through those obstacles and reached the River Meuse, the key river at which the French intend to hold the Germans in the Ardennes region. The Germans cross using a footbridge that the Germans had used in 1914. It really shouldn't have been a surprise to the French army that bridge was there. But although they'd blown up most of the bridges in the area, the French army had left this footbridge intact. Worse, they had left it intact and unguarded. Worse still, they'd left it intact, unguarded, and right at the join between two French corps. So neither corps knew who was responsible for the defence of that bridge. The German crossing is led by Rommel himself. The French army had not been expecting the Germans to reach this area for another 12 days or so and so had not yet begun to dig in their defences in this area. Even so, the French saw, surely have all the advantages. They have a wide river to defend and they have a commanding position as they hold the high ground and the commanding heights. Army Group A is also in terrible trouble as they go through the Ardennes region. One, traffic, one German traffic jam going through the Ardennes roads is actually already 170 miles long as simply too many vehicles are trying to go onto too few roads in too bad a condition. It's a sitting duck for any Allied air attack on these few roads. And these long tailbacks of German vehicles are spotted by Allied aircraft on both the 10th of May and on the 12th of May. General Korat, the commander of the French commander of the Ardennes region, is told about this approaching German armada of vehicles, but he dismisses these air reports as patently absurd. Worried about the traffic jam, the German general Kleist orders Rommel and Guderian to halt their advance. If only for us, his orders had been obeyed. And he tells the German thrust, which remember is meant to break through the French lines and race for the coast. He tells them instead to halt and swing towards the fortified town of Sedan. At this critical juncture, Rommel and Guderian refuse to obey orders and they push ahead with the plan and cross the River Meuse. The key French position was Hill 301. The French artillery was still digging in on top of the hill. The German units didn't reach it until, until nightfall. The German troops, they are tired after their long advance. They are at the bottom of a hill in the dark, watching the French dig in at the top of it. But these German tired, exhausted troops are led by the German general Balk. He's a First World War veteran and he turns to the men and says, what is easy today could cost blood tomorrow. He led the attack at 10.30 at night. The French panic in the dark and flee, abandoning the critical hill, 301. By the 14th of May, the Germans have crossed the River Meuse. And so one small gap, one small gap, has opened up in the French lines in what has been a small skirmish only for this single hill. But then General Georges, the French commander of the front, said, our front has been broken at Sedan. There has been a collapse. And then he broke down weeping. We have here a picture of General Georges. Now in the area, there are still three French armoured divisions held in reserve in the area with 600 tanks. General Georges bones up the commanders of these 600 French tanks and tell them to counterattack at Hill 301 and plug this tiny gap in the line. But even on the phone, he's weeping down the telephone. And we can all appreciate how the French armoured troops 
received these orders. No one wants to be told to go into battle by a general who's crying down the phone. It's hardly inspiring confidence. The French troops are slow to refuel their tanks and they're slow to get moving towards the counterattack. On the 14th of May, the RAF and the French bombing forces are ordered to attack the German bridges across the Meuse, but they, sent, they fail to send sufficient fighter escort. The bombers are sent in alone. It's called the Sedan Massacre. 167 aircraft, British and French, are lost. And the French counterattack fails to happen. Now, General Christ, the German general, is still worried, however, and he orders Guderian once again to halt the German tanks. But again, Guderian refuses. Rommel's tanks start to attack the French tanks, which are still refueling even now. And with the French tanks unable to move, they're sitting ducks for first German tanks. And then Rommel brings up anti-tank guns to support the German tanks. The French 1st Armoured Division lost 134 out of 170 of their tanks in a single day, sitting ducks deployed without fuel in the open. The French armoured forces have collapsed. They had been in the right place at the right time, unfueled, however, and poorly led. Now the race for the sea is on through this narrow gap. The Luftwaffe in the skies, however, still isn't having all everything its own way. And from the 10th to the 14th of May, the Germans had lost an eye-watering 569 aircraft out of their 2,500. So around a, just over a fifth of the German aircraft available had been lost in the space of four days. More Allied aircraft had been destroyed on the ground than in the sky. And on the 14th of May, however, there is a tragedy. The city of Rotterdam is flattened by the Luftwaffe by mistake. The order had come through to cancel the attack, to cancel the terror bombing of Rotterdam, but it arrives too late and 850 civilians are killed. On the 15th of May, Renard calls the new British Prime Minister Churchill and says, we are beaten. We have lost the battle. And of course, most of the French army has yet to see action and the campaign has been going on for five days. The French had no reserves. They had gambled everything on the line holding. It had been broken at Sedan and now millions of men, the best of the French army and the entirety of the BEF were poised in Belgium to be encircled and cut off. They had advanced into the trap that the Germans had laid for them. On the 16th of May, Churchill flew to meet with Renard and Gamelin personally. They had already started to burn state papers in Paris. Churchill suggested that the dash of a few panzers short of fuel across the French countryside should be of small concern. And Gamelin agreed, saying that if counterattacks could be ordered, then it could indeed be rectified. Churchill asked if they'd ordered those counterattacks and Gamelin told him that so far they hadn't ordered any of the counterattacks. Churchill asked, where is the strategic reserve? Gamelin responded, there is none. Churchill was dumbstruck and sent more planes to help the French. The BEF and the French army were ordered to fall back to escape from Belgium if they could, to abandon the dial and to retreat to the river Escart, where of course they could have just gone with Plan E straight away, to retreat therefore 40 miles further west. There had been little fighting along the river Dial. Two million refugees are now clogging the roads, slowing the movements of British and French troops. And on the 18th of May, the Germans reach Cambrai. We have here a map of the dash of Guderian and Rommel's panzers across the countryside and you can see how the British and French get pinned along the river Escart. And so on the 18th of May the Germans reach Cambrai. The French units there were surprised as they weren't expecting to see Germans so quickly and the French surrender without a fight. On the 20th of May the Germans cross the St Quentin Canal and they reach Abbeville. On the 21st of May 
the chief of the Imperial General Staff of the British Army, Ironside, suggests a counterattack. After all, these are quite small German forces that are racing towards the English Channel. The plan is that the British will counterattack from the north, the French army will attack from the south, and they will crush this German panzer force in a vice-like grip. The French general in the area, Billot, agrees, but he's already sunk into depression, and although he'd agreed to take part in the offensive, he actually does nothing. The British will attack alone from the north, and so the British attack at Arras. The British have little to hand, but they attack with what they've got. One single infantry battalion and an armoured battalion. There is no air support for this attack. Despite the failure of the French to take part, despite the failure of air support, the counterattack at Arras still shocks the Germans. If you look closely at the map, you'll be able to see a very small blue line pointing at Arras, the British counterattack. We have here the words of Rundstedt, the German commander. It was feared that the armoured divisions would be cut off before the infantry could come up to support them. None of the French counterattacks were as serious as this. Rommel himself came close to being killed when British tanks started to smash into the column of trucks that he was commanding. But the British attacks soon ran out of steam. Now, Renard, a man of great energy, kept on trying to save the French army in Belgium, to save whatever he can of this French army. Daladier is sacked as Minister of War, as was Gamelin, replaced by a new general, General Weygand. However, General Weygand is at that moment in Syria, in French Syria, and so is quickly recalled to take command of the fighting in France. Pétain, the great First World War general of the French, is also recalled from Spain to be a symbol of resistance. He had been a hero in the war in the Battle of Verdun in 1917. The newly arrived General Weygand is a whirlwind of energy. His first order was to clear the roads of refugees. No one in the French command had fought to do that before. He also, however, needed to be briefed. He needed to know where his units were, as no one could tell him. So to save time, he toured the French, li the French front line by aircraft. But for all his energy and activity, it's too late. Begand asked the Belgian army to take over more of the Escarpe front to allow the British and French to counterattack to the south, beginning on the 26th of May. But it's all too late. The British Army supplies were coming from Le Havre, which you won't find on this map. It's not on this map. It's too far away. And so the British Army was already cut out of supply and British units were running low on food and ammunition. It was all over for this vast, well-equipped British and French army in northern France. The 20, on 21st of May, the Germans turned towards Boulogne, Calais and Dunkirk. But at 12.45 that day, Hitler himself ordered the tanks to halt. Guderian was speechless. One more day and they would close the trap and destroy the British army and the French army in Belgium. But Hitler was remembering the area. He had fought in that area in 1917 and 1918 and believed the area was simply too wet for tanks. General Valamont had been there on holiday in the interwar era and trying to tell Hitler that the area had changed completely since the fighting at Passchendaele, but Hitler simply wouldn't listen. The British managed to plug the gap that had opened up with Labour battalions. Labour battalions were untrained soldiers, people who had not been shown how to use a rifle, but had been sent out with spades so they could try and dig trenches before they finished their training. They're on half rations due to the shortage of food, they quickly have their spades taken off them and they're given rifles for the first time and they're told to hold the roads towards Dunkirk. The evacuation of the wounded began and the evacuations of the wounded will begin on the 19th of May. On the 22nd of May, what was known as Operation Dynamo, the evacuation of the British Army entire would begin from Dunkirk. We have here pictures of the beach at Dunkirk. On the 23rd of May, Boulogne was evacuated. 
General Blanchard of the French First Army, the elite of the French Army, agreed to help Lord Gort, commander of the British Expeditionary Force, to evacuate. From the 26th to the 27th of May, the BEF fall back to Dunkirk, fighting by day, retreating by night, and the British government call up those famous little ships to evacuate the men. On the 25th of May, Churchill's envoy, Spears, met with Reynard and with Weygand and asked what is being done to halt the German tanks. And the British government have some suggestions. They propose putting French 75 millimetre guns onto the back of trucks or to simply ask French civilians to phone command if they see German tanks and to say where they are and where they're heading. The British also ask if the French have considered blowing up bridges to slow the advance of the German tanks. Begand responds, well, what interesting ideas. I'll consider them, for none of them had been attempted. But then there's a critical meeting in Britain on the 26th of May. Lord Halifax suggests negotiating an armistice via Italy in cabinet. The British cabinet argue for two days whether to seek surrender terms. The war cabinet, the men who are making this fateful decision, are Halifax, Churchill, Chamberlain, and two Labour politicians, Attlee and Greenwood. Halifax got angry with Churchill, especially as Churchill wouldn't consider asking for terms and threatened to resign. Now, if he did resign, that would have brought down the British government. The key figure in these arguments is Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain back his friend, Halifax, or a man he hates, Churchill? During discussions, the news arrives to cabinet that Belgium had surrendered, leaving a huge gap in the front line that had been held by the Belgian army, and that only 8,000 of the half a million strong British army had been evacuated. However, despite the fact that it appears all to be over in northern France, critically, Chamberlain decides to stand with Churchill, not with Halifax, and the crisis in the British cabinet passes. Halifax backs down when he realises he doesn't have the support of his friend. But there's still this big gap in the front line where the Belgian army had been. Surely the Germans will just go through the gap. But the gap is plugged by General Montgomery and his third division racing to the gap. Now to achieve this, the third division is already fighting the Germans. Their order is to counterattack, to push back the German army, to drive it back, to allow them then to hand over their bar to the front, to the flank units of the British 4th and 5th divisions, and then to get onto their trucks and race for the gap, to get to the gap and push the Germans back there as well. It's a superb operation. By the 30th, the BEF have reached Dunkirk. Having reached Dunkirk, they blow up the bridges around the city and prepare to hold to grim death. The Germans found it incredibly difficult to break in against what was a foe well dug in and determined to hold, showing just what could have been achieved and indeed should have been achieved by the French army at Sedan. By the end, a handful of battalions would hold off in four German divisions, showing that tiny numbers of soldiers could indeed hold back hordes if determined to do so. By the 4th of June, 338,000 men would be evacuated from Dunkirk, including 140,000 French soldiers. From the 4th to the 7th of June, there was also another evacuation, this one from Norway, north of Norway, the town of Narvik. 24,500 men would also be picked off there and brought back to Britain. But due to a staggering coincidence, as the Norway evacuation was going on, the German fleet decided that they were going to raid the British convoys, taking food and ammunition to this army of Norway. The Germans don't know the British are evacuating. They believe the British intend to stay there. And so they try and sink the ships bringing food to those armies. The Germans send pretty much every warship they have. Four, sorry, two battle cruisers, one heavy cruiser and four destroyers. As they steam towards the convoy lines, they come across a British aircraft carrier, the Glorious, with no planes armed. All the aircraft on the Glorious, they're, un they're, they're not fueled up, they're not armed. The Glorious is a sitting duck, protected just by two destroyers. 
And so the destroyers charge the German fleet. And the British destroyer Acosta manages to torpedo the Scharnhorst, crippling it. However, it's not enough, and the Glorious and the boat destroyers are sunk. But with the actions of the destroyer Acosta, the evacuation is saved. Those 24,500 men are rescued, along with King Haken and the Norwegian government and the Norwegian government's gold reserves, all brought back to Britain to fund Britain's war efforts. With the German fleet now in harbour, the British go for revenge for the loss of the Glorious, and the British aircraft carrier Ark Royal launches port strikes against these German ships, crippling the second German battle cruiser, the Neiser now. The German fleet has now been reduced in those actions to one heavy cruiser, two light cruisers and four destroyers. This was never going to challenge the might of the Royal Navy for control of the seas. The German surface fleet is for now a spent force. Italy, however, has been persuaded to enter the war and Italy is persuaded to enter the war for two reasons. Firstly, Germany was clearly winning and winning big. Secondly, the French also encouraged Italy to enter the war against them. And that might sound odd, but the French diplomacy towards Italy was desperate. They offered Italy a long list of French colonies if Italy would stay out of the war. And the Italians realised that if Italy was, that if France was prepared to just give Italy an empire to stay out of the war now, think what Italy could gain if they entered the war. Renard also persuaded Churchill to ask President Roosevelt to ask what Mussolini would want in the way of British and French colonies if Italy would stay out of the war. Italy refuses all offers. They know that France is beaten and that Britain has lost 85,000 vehicles and 2,500 artillery pieces abandoned on the beaches of Dunkirk and Italy wants Egypt off the British. By the 5th of June, France has lost 1.2 million men mostly taken prisoner of war. France now only has 64 divisions, poorly equipped and demoralised, to fight off 104 German divisions full of confidence. And so case read the attack to take Paris. Army Group B would break through and push on Rouen, while Army Group A would break through and attack the Maginot Line from behind. But this time the French army fights hard, supported by only a single British division, the 51st Highland Division, that had been based on the Maginot Line. A new British expeditionary force commanded by Sir Alan Brooke is sent, and that contains again a single British division landed at Cherbourg, with a promise of two more to follow. Now the French are desperate for more divisions and beg for more British divisions to be sent, but there simply aren't any more British divisions equipped. Churchill goes to meet with Renard and as he's flying back from Paris, his air transport is seen by German fighters, but they fail to shoot down the aircraft. After Churchill has left his meeting with Renard, the French hold another meeting just for themselves. Now Renard, the French Prime Minister, wants to fight to the bitter end. He says that with the front line broken before Paris, he thinks the French army should retreat into Brittany to form the Brittany Redoubt, to hold out in Brittany. If not, then he says they should evacuate the French army to Britain and to French North Africa and carry on the fight from the French Empire. Renard is not for surrendering. However, Begand and Petain said that France would never forgive him if he didn't surrender. On the 10th of June, Italy enters the war. And on the 12th of June, Vagand tells the French government that they must ask for an armistice. On the 14th of June, German troops enter Paris. The British start to evacuate the last of their army from France. Another 200,000 men evacuated from Cherbourg and Brest. Now, Renard sends General de Gaulle to London to ask for British help to fight on from the colonies. Reynard is still convinced that France will not surrender and will fight on from the French Empire. Now Churchill suggests a union between Britain and France to become one country after this war is over. There will be no more British and French, they will instead just be one country there, sharing their empires and with their citizens having shared citizenship. 
the French government rejected. On the 17th of June, Renard resigns, replaced by Pétain. Renard tries to escape France and go to the French Empire to lead resistance there. However, tragically for France and tragically for Britain, as Renard is attempting to escape to go to the French Empire to rally resistance to the Germans overseas, he's involved in a car crash. And when he comes to, he'll be a prisoner of war and France will already have surrendered. On the 18th of June, Pétain orders the French troops to lay down their arms and also refuses the French fleet permission to sail to the United States of America. And this is important because the French fleet was the fourth largest in the world behind the British, Americans and Japanese. The French fleet was incredibly powerful and the German fleet, of course, has been all but beaten. And so before we go for our tea break, why was the battle for France lost when the French seemingly had every advantage? Well, there are a number of reasons. Firstly, the French commanders were too old. General Georges, 64. General Gamelin, 68. He's replaced by General Vegand, 73 years old. And Pétain was 84 years old. The French army was mired in bureaucracy. It was top heavy and it was lacking in initiative. There was a problem of complacency. Not a single landmine had been laid at the critical stretch of front of Sedan as it had simply been overlooked. They'd request the air troops in the area had requested landmines near the start of the war, but they had not been delivered due to an administration error and no one had fought to chase it because they didn't think it would matter. Intelligence reports of the German advance through the Ardennes had consistently been ignored. The French army had too few radios and it has to be said that although the French army had state-of-the-art artillery and tanks, these are useless if they're not deployed. But the key reason why this great French army was beaten and so quickly in what is, by the way, one of the most surprising military campaigns of world history, the key reason for the defeat of this impressive, well-equipped and well-trained French army was the gamble on the breeder variant. It had been a fatal gamble for France. What then had been the consequences of this surrender? Now, Britain had assumed that France would lead the land war. That's now obviously not going to be the case. The British Expeditionary Force had been the most mechanised in the world. It will now have to be rebuilt. But still, the British don't plan to build a large army. They're going to keep their army small at 55 divisions. They're going to instead now rely on resistance movements in occupied territories on air and sea power to win the war. The bulk of the French fleet went to North Africa, to Mers el Kabir, near the port, near, near, sorry, near the great city of Iran. Now, Admiral Darlan, the commander of the French fleet, wants to go and join the Allies in the Caribbean to try and free France. However, he changes his mind when Pétain makes him Minister of Marine in the Vichy government, and he is therefore cheaply bought off. And this large French fleet is now a real danger to the British Empire. On the 2nd of July, of July, Force H, led by Admiral Somerville, is sent to deal with the French fleet. He wants them to join the British fighting against the Germans, but he can't allow them to be taken by the Germans to be used for an invasion of Britain. And we have here the French fleet at Mers el Kabir, 1940. He told them to surrender or be destroyed from his flagship, the HMS Hood. The French leader, there, Admiral Gensol actually wants to join the Allies. He wants to hand over these warships to the British. However, he doesn't have the authority to do so from Admiral Darlan, so he rejects the ultimatum and the British fleet open fire on their former allies, sinking a French battleship, the Breton, and crippling another four French battleships. Days later, the modern French battleship Reichlau is crippled at Dakar. The French fleet has been removed for the loss of 1,300 French dead killed by their former allies. Vichy France will now be very hostile to the British indeed. And Spain is now a threat too to the British Empire. But it's unwilling to join the war. It wants Gibraltar and it thinks Britain's beaten, but it's reluctant to join the war because it's dependent on British supplies. The UK goes for a carrot and stick approach. They offer Spain economic aid, 
But they also make it clear that if Spain joins the war, then Spain will be blockaded back to the Stone Age. British war supplies, however, are now also interrupted. Our war economy had depended on timber from Scandinavia, food from the Netherlands and Denmark, iron ore from Sweden and French North Africa, and oil from Romania. All of these sources have now gone. But the British economy coped well, thanks to their global empire. And the large Norwegian merchant fleet had also escaped, it included the world's third largest oil tanker fleet. The Belgian and Dutch empires also continue the struggle and they're highly valuable and available now to the British war effort. Now metal and food will come from Australia, New Zealand and Canada. Oil will come from the Caribbean, but journey times have increased by 40%, straining British merchant marine. On the 25th of June at 1.35 a.m., the French agree an armistice. Hitler could not decide on how he's going to beat Britain. He thought that now with the British army beaten and disarmed, that Britain couldn't possibly carry on the war. But Hitler fails to understand the British way of war. With the British army disarmed, the British will rebuild and rely on their navy and their air force. Most of the ultimately 150,000 French soldiers evacuated from Dunkirk and in subsequent evacuations have to be returned to France. The British hope that these 150,000 combat trained troops will stay in Britain to join the Free French Army. Very few of them do. And the British government's forced to negotiate with the Germans to allow British ships to take these men back to France to go into prisoner of war camps after such dangerous efforts to rescue them from Dunkirk. But despite French troops returning to France to go into prisoner of war camps, people from Poland, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands and Belgium are all trying to escape Nazi occupied Europe to carry on the fight from Britain. Britain would fight on, but how could they win? Now, we're going to leave it there for five minutes. So we're going to return at five minutes past eight so we can get those kettles on, I can refill my little teapot. I hope you've enjoyed the first half of the fall of France. We will now see after, at five minutes past eight, the battle for Britain and the beginning of the campaign in the desert. If you do have any questions, please remember to put them onto the feed so that I can take your questions at the end of the talk. And I'll see you all in five minutes. Thank you very much.
be uh, restarting in less than a minute. Please just allow me to pour myself a cup of tea. Please don't forget to post any questions that you wish to ask. I'd like to, to thank Aberdeen Museum for inviting me to, to speak with you all tonight. It's always a pleasure to um, to help out Aberdeen Museum. And I have to say, I've been missing my trips down south. I hope that I'll be able to join you all in person next year when this uh, when this madness is over. Give people a few seconds more and we begin. I do remember that if you wish to uh, if you wish to, to listen to this again, or if you missed the start, perhaps then. This will be made available and sold on the Aberdeen Museum YouTube channel. And so, with the fall of France, we begin with the battle for Britain. Now, the Luftwaffe is ill prepared to fight this kind of conflict in the skies over Britain due to chaos in Nazi Germany. Now, they do design a superb fighter for the campaign, the Heinkel 112 which you've probably not heard of, quite frankly, but the Heinkel 112 is a superb aircraft. Better than the Messerschmitt 109, which is, of course, much more famous. It's got a longer range. However, the designer Messerschmitt was a good Nazi party man, whereas the designer Heinkel was suspected of having Jewish blood. And so when it came to which one they decided to produce, the Germans decided to produce the Messerschmitt 109, not the Heinkel 112. Goering, in charge of the, uh, the German Air Force, is also convinced that the ME110 is a good fighter. He calls them destroyers of the sky, and he's convinced that they will be one of the key war-winning weapons in the skies. He also messes around with the design of the Junker 88 bomber. It's a medium bomber designed to drop bombs on a flat surface, but he decides after seeing how successful the Stuka dive bomber had been in Spain, but the Ju-88 had to be able to dive bomb as well. A complete waste of time. To do so, they have to reduce the size of the bomb payload, they have to rebuild the aircraft to be able to cope with the strains of dive bombing, and if you want a dive bomber, you use the Junker 87 Stuka, instead of just ruining what had been a really good design of bomber. And so the German aircraft, Air Force, although it appears in propaganda images to be impressive and modern, had a number of technical design weaknesses in their equipment. Also, in June 1940, as they approached the critical battle for France, the Germans had stripped the German training schools of pilots and planes, meaning that they're now short of training facilities for pilots, and the German bomber force had also suffered heavy, heavy losses in the skies over Dunkirk. And so, they better win any air war against the British quickly. From the 15th of May to the 4th of June, the British Bomber Command, freed now from French interference, conducted 1,700 sorties against German cities. Did it do much damage? No. But the British are determined to show that they're still in the fight by bombing German cities. But after the losses in France and in the skies over Dunkirk, the British Fighter Command, they'd lost, the British had lost 396 Hurricane and 76 Spitfires, and they're down to only 331 fighters left. But, critically, the Germans have to spend three weeks building air bases in northern France, as the Messerschmitt 109, unlike the Heinkel 112, was simply too short-ranged to operate in the skies over England from the existing bases. And so the British are given these crucial three weeks to repair and recover. And Lord Beaverbrook had been put in command of British air production in the set on the 17th of May. And he had ordered that from now on, the British would only try and produce five aircraft. Previously, the British had been producing a bewildering variety of aircraft. But due to aircraft losses, they would just try and build five. They would be the Spitfire, the Hurricane, the Blenheim, the Whitley, and the Hampton. Production rose from 130 aircraft a week to 300 aircraft a week. And in June, 
the British built twice the number of planes that Germany did, despite the fact that Germany can now call upon the industrial resources of Europe. Um, but by July, British fighter command have 600 aircraft. And unlike the French, they have a fully working radar chain. And the British keep on bombing Germany day and night as Germany prepares for its air assault on Britain, launching 58 raids in July and 48 one of those were against German cities. Now in July, Germany starts bombing the channel shipping over the English Channel to try and draw the RAF out over the English Channel and into battle. The RAF in the skies butcher Stukas but largely refuse to come out and fight as they recover their losses. Meanwhile, the British Empire is being armed. Now the British expect 21 out of 55 divisions in their army to come from the British Empire. Canadian troops have already started to arrive in the United Kingdom. Australian, New Zealand and Indian troops are being sent to the Middle East. And Canada is a godsend to the British. With its excellent weather and its long distance from the front line, it's a gift for pilot training. Rhodesia, as it was called then, and South Africa were soon also turned into giant pilot training centres. The Home Guard had been formed on the 14th of May as the local defence volunteers. And by now, it's actually, put aside our dad's army view, it's actually quite effective. It's made up of First World War veterans and farmers who are good shots, and also local people who know the land. And they're now being well equipped with rapidly purchased American First World War equipment. Yes, the equipment is obsolete, but a rifle is a rifle at the end of the day. The British Army was also, by July, ready to launch counterattacks on any German beach landings. Yes, they have some serious equipment shortages, but they're trying to make up that as quickly as they can. In the July Channel Battles for the Skies, the Luftwaffe was only able to use around 10% of its aircraft strength because, the, because Hitler is wanting the British to surrender. Hitler is worried that if he launches an all-out attack on the British straight away, then British losses will be so high that the British will be vent in a vengeful mood and not want to discuss peace. He's convinced that as long as British losses remain low, Britain will come to terms with Germany. And so in the skies over the English Channel, 185 German aircraft are shot down to 96 British losses. But on the 1st of August 1940, Hitler gets fed up of waiting for the British to surrender. And he starts, it starts to occur to him that they're simply not going to. So Hitler orders directive number 16, an order to prepare for the invasion of England. Now the Kriegsmarine, the German fleet, said that they'll be ready by the 15th of September. Goering still had not started planning for the air war, but said that the area would soon be destroyed. On the 6th of August, the Luftwaffe is finally ready, but the weather is now bad and so the attack is delayed. And so the 13th of August will be Eagle Day, the start of the aerial attack on Britain. Goering believed that the RAF could be destroyed in just four days, but the Germans massively underestimate the strength of the RAF. They believe that British production of aircraft had been 50% lower than it had been in reality. And also Goering fatally underestimates the importance of radar. Now, they believe that they'd shot down around 350 British fighters up to the 12th of August. They'd actually managed to shoot down 181. Now they believed that the British had produced around 300 fighters in this time. In reality, the British had produced 700. So the British have a lot more fighters than the Germans think. And Eagle Day, the start of this aerial attack, is badly organized. The fighter escort for the German attacks are canceled, but the bombing attacks go ahead anyway. Now, some RAF airstrips are attacked, but the damage inflicted upon them is slight. However, even though the damage inflicted on them is slight in these early attacks, German intelligence says that these airfields are destroyed. And so many of these airfields are never attacked again because German intelligence believe they've already been knocked out. German losses are high. However, Churchill, it must be said, is more worried about the situation in the Middle East than he is about the situation in Britain. In the Middle East, to face the Italians, 
Britain has 36,000 men in Egypt and 27,500 men in Palestine. And they're supported by around 200 mostly obsolete aircraft. However, even with the Battle of Britain at its height, then the British are still sending reinforcements out to the Middle East to face the Italians. On the 15th of August, Goering starts stops all the attacks on British radar stations, as he thinks they're pointless. In fact, Goering wants the British RAF chain to be working. Now that sounds really odd. Why would Goering want the British radar chain to be working? He knows that radar will warn the British when the Germans are coming, and he wants the British aircraft to take up to take off to go and fight the Germans in the sky so that the Germans can shoot the RAF down. Of all the tactical blunders, it's a work, quite frankly, of near insanity. And he also started to attack the RAF factories, however, instead of the RAF bases. Yes, harming future British production, but doing little to help win the immediate battle. On the 18th of August, there is a huge aerial battle. Germany lost 67 aircraft mostly Stukas and 110s, to the British loss of 33 aircraft. It's the Luftwaffe's worst day of losses since the 10th of May. But the RAF too is being worn down. Now it has plenty of aircraft, but the British are desperately worried about a shortage of pilots. In August, the RAF would lose 176 pilots in the air war. And it has to be said though, against these losses, Germany would lose 993 pilots and air crew, as the losses in planes are more even. The RAF lose 389 to Germany 694, but British pilots shot down can be recovered. A lot of them, of course, they're shot down over Britain, and a lot of them can survive and then be given a new aircraft and be ready to fight again. That's not the case for German aircraft shot down over Britain. And so even despite these advantages, however, the air war seems to hang in the balance. The British believed that they needed to shoot down three German aircraft for every one they lost, and they weren't even managing to shoot down two German aircraft for every one they lost, they lose. The British are once again overestimating the strength of Germany, while Germany is underestimating the strength of Britain. And shipping losses caused by the U-boats are continuing to mount up. In June, the British lose 134 merchant ships. In July, they lose 102. And in August, they lose another 91 merchant ships, as the U-boats have now replaced their, their defective magnetic torpedoes. If you remember from last week, those torpedoes not working, they've replaced them now with simpler, more reliable technology. But the RAF continue to bomb factories in Germany and North Italy especially a favourite target of British bombers were the Fiat factory at Turin. The Germans try at this stage to avoid bombing British cities in the hope that low civilian losses will encourage the British to surrender. From the 24th to the 25th of August, the Luftwaffe accidentally bombed London. 103 British bombers are sent to bomb Berlin in revenge. Now this is callous I know but the British government was hoping that the Germans would then stop bombing British airfields to start bombing British cities, as those airfields are vital and it works. And the Germans, furious at the British bombing of Berlin, switched their targets to British cities. Now by September, the RAF are still fighting. Stukas had to be withdrawn from the skies over England as they were simply too vulnerable leaving the Luftwaffe's bomber development in tatters. The Germans have been convinced that the dive bomber had been the key weapon of war and the future for aerial warfare. And then now this critical battle, they're having to stop using their dive bombers. However, this panics the British government as they believed that the Stukas were being withdrawn, not because they were too vulnerable, but to be saved to support the ground invasion of the British Isles. At this stage, only still a single RAF airbase has been taken out of action for more than 24 hours. Those large grass airstrips the British are using are hard to destroy and German aircraft bomb loads are simply too small to do the job. However, Dowdin, head of British Fighter Command, is still very worried. His squadrons are down to 75% pilot strength. But again, the RAF are overestimating the strength of the Luftwaffe. 
Germany assumed that the ARIA was 50% smaller than it actually was. The British were assuming the Luftwaffe was twice the size that it actually was. Now, RAF pilots during this conflict had far more leave and actually flew less than German pilots. But even so, the RAF pilots are exhausted. But now think about the state of mind of the German pilots. On average, RAF pilots would fly three flights a day. German pilots were expected to fly four to seven flights a day. German pilots had no leave at all during the conflict. RAF pilots were given one day off a week and two days off every three weeks as the British government wanted to look after its pilots in a way that the German authorities and the Göring simply weren't interested in doing. The Luftwaffe was being ground down. Italian aircraft were sent to take part in the Battle of Britain by Mussolini to help the Germans, but they failed to shoot down a single RAF aircraft. The British army was also being reformed under Brook, planning for a mobile defence in depth if the Germans should get ashore. The British now have 27 divisions equipped ready to face an invasion, but they do still have some serious shortages of equipment, particularly anti-tank guns. The Home Guard now has 600,000 rifles, 25,000 light machine guns and 22,000 heavy machine guns and has been equipped with steel helmets and uniforms bought off the Americans in return for Britain's gold and dollar reserves. And the Home Guard had also started to form commando units, stay behind units in case of invasion. The British become the first country to prepare, to prepare for occupation before it happens. The idea was that they would wait for the German army to roll past their position and then to start conducting terrorist attacks upon supply lines, suicide attacks if need be, to try and wipe out German supplies on home soil. The RAF has also prepared 16 squadrons to drop poison gas on any German beach landing. As soon as a German soldier sets foot on a British beach, the plan is simply to drench that beach in mustard gas and see what comes staggering out. It's a brutal but likely highly effective plan. And the Royal Navy has concentrated its immense strength to try and resist invasion by concentrating in the English Channel and around East Anglia. On the 7th of September, though, the British government believed that invasion is imminent. That day, the Luftwaffe switched from bombing airfields to bombing London. Now, the invasion is meant to go ahead on the 15th of September. But with the RAF clearly still fighting, the invasion is pushed back to the 12th of October. There is a, a, a series of furious air battles in the skies over London, particularly on the 15th of September. And the RAF, led by Park, had developed new tactics where Spitfires would go after the 109 and Hurricanes would go after the bombers. Now, Lee Mallory and Bader, in charge of the British fighters in the Midlands, had experimented with so-called big wings. Instead of setting up small numbers of aircraft as quickly as you can to fight the Germans, to get large numbers into the skies of the Midlands and then to go en masse to take part in a big duel with the Germans. And as it happens, I'm sat here chatting to you from Calverton in Nottingham, in the valley over a little village called Woodborough is the manor house where they would meet to come up with these plans. It's a tiny little village but very picturesque if you ever get a chance to, to visit it. But these, these new tactics are a mistake. The big wings are a bad idea because often they arrive too late to actually attack the Germans. Normally, when they do arrive, the Germans have gone. But on the 15th of September, critically, they do arrive in, London, in the skies over London on time. And the arrival of all these aircraft shock the Germans as they prove that the RAF was not on its last legs as they believed. By October, the invasion would be further delayed until the spring of 1941. The Battle of Britain had been won. However, October would see German night attacks onto British cities, the Blitz. The British public would suffer, but they had not been beaten. And so now we look at the war in the, in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. The Italians defeated. And so on the 13th of September, the Italians, the Italian army had entered from Libya into Egypt to try and take the, the vital British colony. 
Egypt is vital to the British because of the Suez Canal and the route to India. The British must hold Egypt. And so the Italian army enter Egypt from Libya, their Italian colony, under command of Graziani. Now, he had replaced the Italian general, Balbo, who had been killed when his own aircraft transports had been shot down by his own side by Italian anti-aircraft guns over to, uh, around Tobruk, who had mistaken his transport aircraft for British bombers. The Italian army is highly reluctant to fight the British. The Italian Navy, too, is incredibly reluctant to engage. Now, in July, the Italian Navy had clashed with the British at the Battle of Calabre and been given a bloody nose. Italy is, itself is in a bad way. A third of the Italian population at this time was illiterate and its economy was still running on peacetime work patterns. It might be extraordinary, but in July, the Italian War Office started to close at two in the afternoon again so that its staff could go home early. The Italian equipment is mostly made by Fiat and in this time period the Fiat equipment is underpowered, underarmed, underarmoured and badly out of date. That's especially the case for its tanks. But the Italians have 71 divisions but of those 71 divisions only four of those divisions have any tanks at all. The, the head of the Italian armoured forces said that the tank was less important in warfare than the mule. Inspiring words from a tank commander. When Italy had declared war, it also closed down all its pilot training schemes, as it, like Germany, believed that the war would be short, and so sent pilot trainers to the front lines to be used as combat pilots. Now, the day that Italy entered the war had also seen an attack by the Italians on the vital British colony of Malta, that vital island that can command the central Mediterranean. Malta at this time is poorly defended by a handful of obsolete Gloucester Gladiator biplanes. But the attack was pathetic. It was conducted at high altitude and with no plans of a follow-up invasion. Only the Italian Navy is any good. Now, Italy had 71 submarines, the most of any nation in the world. I know when we think of submarines, we think of Germany, but actually they had very few at this time, whereas Italy has 71 submarines clearly a devastating force but in the clear waters of the Mediterranean then British spotter aircraft could see the location of the Italian submarines and they had an absolute field day sinking 13 of these Italian submarines in July alone and in September of 1940 600,000 Italian soldiers had to be sent home to help collect the harvest and due to a shortage of weapons to actually equip them with. The army is badly struggling for supplies. And part of this is its own fault. The Italian army had rifles and machine guns using 11 different calibers or sizes of bullets. Imagine the supply difficulties of trying to give 11 different size bullets to your front, your front line units. It is a logistical nightmare. But despite all of this, General Graziani still has 167,000 men and 300 tanks to fight just 36,000 British soldiers in Egypt. He has overwhelming superiority. They advance 40 miles into Egypt to Sidi Barini and stop. Now in the Atlantic, the German U-boats are still causing carnage with the bulk of the British destroyers still in the channel and around East Anglia guarding against invasion. In total, 865 merchant ships would be sunk in 1940 including neutral shipping, all lost while not in, well, mostly lost while not in convoy, while British convoy escorts lack the range to cover the mid-Atlantic. But the Italians, uh, sorry, the Italians rapidly overrun the British colony of Somaliland in East Africa. But the Italian uh, home front is running horribly short of food. And on the 10th of November, another 750,000 Italian soldiers are sent home. And so now the Italian army, which had shrunk by 600,000, shrinks again by another three quarters of a million men because they can't feed the soldiers and they can't feed the people back home. The Italian army now numbers 1.5 million men. Now Mussolini was also not in a, not in a good position. He's locked into a war with a bullying, 
overly dominant ally. And Britain seems to be getting stronger by the day, not weaker. And on the 12th of October, Mussolini gets more bad news when he learns that German military units have entered into Romania. They've been invited into Romania and that the only anti-aircraft units that are invited around the oil fields of Ploesti, that's feeding the German war economy with oil. However, this is a huge blow to Italian pride as Re Mussolini considered that Romania was in the Italian sphere of influence. He is now paranoid that Italy is losing ground to Germany. And so he plans to regain his prestige and his position against the Germans by invading Greece in alliance with Bulgaria. However, he doesn't actually tell the Bulgarians that he plans to invade Greece and doesn't ask them. As soon as he does get round to asking Bulgaria if they wish to enter the war by attacking Greece, the Bulgarians politely refuse. But on the 19th of October, Mussolini also uh, rejects German plans to bring Vichy France into the war against Britain as a German ally and refuses further the offer of German troops for North Africa. He says that the Italian army doesn't need German troops in North Africa, they can win without them. And he also tells Hitler that he plans to invade Greece from Albania. Now Greece has an army of 300,000 men and it knows the Italians are coming. There will be no advantage of surprise. The invasion begins on the 28th of October. The Greek army outfought the Italians and by the 1st of November they had broken the Italian lines. By the 4th of November Italian troops are pushed back into Albania out of Greece. And then the 11th of November the Royal Navy launch Operation Judgment. Now they cooperate with spotter aircraft flying from Malta. The Italian fleet, one of the great fleets of the world, has six battleships, 14 cruisers, 27 destroyers, all in port at Taranto. The British Admiral Cunningham decides that the carrier aircraft are going to be his key strike unit. And so he launches a port strike against Taranto. Two waves of obsolete swordfish bombers are launched from HMS Illustrious. Two of these swordfish are shot down, but an Italian battleship is sunk and another two Italian battleships are crippled, as were an Italian heavy cruiser and two destroyers. For Italy, it's a catastrophe. They lose half their capital ships, half their battleships in a single night to these biplanes launched from illustrious. And of course, going forward, Japan watches the results of this port strike and begin to plan for how they might deal with the American fleet if it comes to war in the future. Now, this would soon be followed by a British attack in Egypt as the British launch Operation Compass. And this fight will last from December 1940 to February 1941. Now the British have been reinforced in Egypt by an extra 150 tanks that are sent from Britain at the height of the Battle of Britain to Egypt to try and bolster the British defences of the Middle East as the British are desperate to actually the British army really wants to fight somewhere and they decide that the Mediterranean theatre in particular the Middle East is going to be their key theatre of war. And you might say why have the British decided that North Africa is going to be their focus of operations? Well there's a number of, of uh, advantages to do so. Firstly it could keep Spain out of the war. Also it can make Italy a liability for the Germans and it could if they do really well threaten the Ploesti oil fields in Romania, which is vital to the German war effort. On the, sorry, since October 1940, the Rifle Brigade in Egypt has started to scout out the Italian positions around Sidi Barini, and they'd launched a series of raids from the desert. Now, led by the great British general, Richard O'Connor, and he really is known as one of the great generals of the British Army at this time, Certainly the Germans know him as the Great O'Connor. General O'Connor knows the British Army is outnumbered four to one. Conventional military logic is that for you to attack, you need to outnumber your enemy by three to one. But he is outnumbered himself by four to one. But he has a daring plan of attack in the desert. Seventh Armoured Division, supported by the 4th Indian Division, would attack on the 9th of December, achieving total surprise the Italians know they have overwhelming superiority in numbers 
and didn't dream that the British would dare to attack. By the 11th, they had captured 38,300 Italian soldiers, 237 guns and 73 tanks. They'd attacked the Italian army from three sides, including from behind, having sneaked through the desert. By the 25th of December, the British would push the Italians out of Egypt and then would be reinforced by the 6th Australian Division and soon Bardia would be surrounded in Libya. And so back in Britain, however, the Blitz continued and the Blitz took a terrible toll upon British civilian life. In September, the British lost 7,000 dead and 10,000 wounded. In October, 8,000 dead and 8,000 wounded. In November, 5,000 dead and 6,000 wounded as the Germans burn British cities. On the 14th of November, Coventry is hit by 450 bombers in the largest attack so far in what is a terrible psychological blow for the British. In revenge, 100 British bombers attack Hamburg. But it has to be said, the RAF soon realise that they are desperately short of night fighters to stop the Blitz. They can control the skies over England by day, but by night, the Germans seem to be able to attack at will. Meanwhile, Hitler starts to plan for the invasion of the USSR. He's desperate to beat the British in the east, as he called it. But what else could he do? He clearly lacks the naval power to invade Britain. Britain has fought off the Luftwaffe in the skies, and Britain is getting stronger and stronger by the day. In December of 1940, the Germans send aircraft out to Sicily to try and help the Italians in the Mediterranean. On the 14th of December, the Germans start to plan an invasion of Greece to help out to rescue their Italian allies. On the 5th of January, however, the British capture that critical port of Bardia, including capturing another 45,000 Italian soldiers and 130 tanks. The Australians lose take just 500 casualties in the fighting. On the 7th of July, the British surround the great fortress port of Tobruk in Libya. So here we see the advance from Bardia to Tobruk, to the great fortress. As the British are advancing through the desert, they take the 4th Indian Division out of the fighting in North Africa to send it to East Africa to try and deal with the vast Italian army in what is then Abyssinia, now Ethiopia. On the 22nd of January, the fortress of Tobruk fell with another 25,000 Italian soldiers, 208 guns and 87 tanks. Well, on the 24th, the British, Gen uh, British overall commander of the Middle East, Wavell, decides to start the invasion of Italian East Africa with the invasion of Italian Somaliland. The Italians have a quarter of a million soldiers in Somaliland and Abyssinia, and he's determined to destroy this vast Italian army that threatens Egypt from behind. In February, General Cullinan launches a full assault on the Italian army in Abyssinia from Kenya with troops taken from South Africa. And on the 12th of February, the famous General O'Connor captures another 20,000 Italians and 200 guns and another 120 tanks in an action that involves just 3,000 British soldiers. As Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary said, never has so much been surrendered to so few. But on that very same day, with the Italian army humiliated in Libya, Rommel arrives in Libya with the German Africa Corps to try and change the fighting in the desert. And so there we leave our story of the Second World War, with the British having beaten the Italians in North Africa, with the Greeks having fought off the Italian invasion, with the British bearing down on that vast Italian army in East Africa, but with the submarines of Germany doing terrible damage to British convoy lines and with British civilians suffering terrible losses from German bombing in the skies over Britain and with Britain trying to bomb Germany back to show they're still in the war. Britain's lonely struggle will continue until the German invasion of the USSR. But we will return to that. And I hope you will join me next year, 
next Remembrance Day, next Armistice Day, for the 1940, sorry, 1941 talk, which I hope will be in person in Abingdon. Now, if anybody has any questions, please do put the questions onto the uh, onto the feed. So try and load that up now. Let's clean the wrong button. Ah, we've got a number of questions here. Let's just see. Let's publish this one. This one looks right. So, I'm surprised to hear that Britain had counted on iron ore from Sweden and oil from Romania. This is where Germany, quite rightly, got their iron ore and oil from. Could those countries have delivered to both? Yes, indeed. Sweden was uh, Sweden was uh, very open in its neutrality, but they would uh, they were very happy to sell to anyone who would pay, as long as it kept them out of the war. And so, Sweden would ultimately find that its preferred customer would be Germany after the fall of Norway, because then Britain wouldn't actually be able to get access to Swedish iron ore. And so when Na when Narvik was in German hands, the British picked up their Swedish iron ore mostly from um, from the port of, Nar of Narvik. As soon as Norway is conquered, then Sweden really has only one choice of customer. And uh, it has to be said that, uh, Germans, uh, that the German economy was very dependent on Swedish iron ore and Romanian oil. Romania initially preferred to sell oil to the British. Uh, the British were able to pay cash, which always helps. And Romania had initially, of course, been pro-British and had been willing to go to war with Germany in 1938. However, after the fall of France, as it was really France rather than Britain that Romania was close to, then Romania feels that it has no option but to, to, to bend with the wind and fit with new realities. Romania will in future change sides. They'll fight for Germany. They'll enter the war on Germany's behalf in 1941 and they'll then change sides again in 1944 when their army will be used and frankly abused by Stalin to die for Russia, which is why Romania will have the, uh, the unenviable position of topping casualty lists for both the Axis and the Allies in the Second World War. They'll certainly be bled by both sides and uh, cruelly used it has to be said. And so the, uh, it's really the defeat of France that changes things for Romania and it's the defeat of Norway that changes things for Sweden. And if I just see what other questions we've got here. Oh, this one's interesting. Let's, uh, let's go with that one. So Dowden is supposed to have successfully opposed sending much of fighter command to France in 1940. How important was this? That way it's absolutely vital. On your right, Dowdin opposed the drip feeding of fighter command. Churchill was keen to try and do anything he could to prop up Renard's efforts to keep France in the war. and felt therefore that sending more aircraft was a, a cheap way, really, of keeping the French in the war. We can see with hindsight that uh, due to the traffic accident that would take Renard out of the conflict, and that really is a, a tragic moment for the British and French in the war, that uh, the French were not going to be kept in the war and certain situation couldn't be rescued by more fighter squadrons being sent. Whatever was going to be sent was going to be lost. The loss of those fighter squadrons would have seriously undermined British efforts to win the Battle of Britain and drive the, the German efforts off. Now, as for how important it is, certainly that's important in the Battle of Britain. Whether defeating the Battle of Britain could have led to a successful German invasion of Britain itself, that is a lot more doubtful. It's the it's the pause, I suppose, that's fatal for the Germans. Firstly, the, the British have overwhelming naval strength and they're prepared to use it to control those waters. And so a German invasion of Britain, even with control of the skies, highly risky. Now, before you think, I know you're going to think that the German Air Force could simply destroy the, the British fleet in the English Channel and around East Anglia. But what we have to remember is that before 1941, no battleship at sea is destroyed by aircraft. Now, the aircraft of 1941 are, are simply more potent than those available to the both sides in 1940. And with a concentration of warships, the, the Royal Navy would have been confident of being, being able to hold off the Luftwaffe's air attacks. The Luftwaffe was notoriously bad at targeting uh, British ships at sea. If you look at the Crete 
evacuation in 1941. Yes, the British do lose warships like the, the, the light cruiser Gloucester that was evacuating British um, British troops from, from Crete. But the Germans really struggle with hitting ships at sea that are moving. They're, they're difficult targets and it's, they're, they're small targets for a start. And so, yes, it's important for the Battle of Britain. Whether it would have changed the war, I have my doubts because I it's really hard to see a, a successful German invasion of Britain in 1940. If they're to do so, they really have to do so before the British concentrate their fleet in the Channel and East Anglia. They'd really have to go straight away with the fall of France. And of course, for political reasons, Hitler didn't want to do so. And then it would have been a massive gamble as he'd have been gambling that German army crossing what is, yes, a short stretch of water, but one British warship could have conducting can have inflicted horrific losses on any German invasion. And so it is a huge challenge for the Germans and a huge risk to be able to attempt that kind of invasion, even with control of the skies. Uh, of course, it could be easier with control of the skies. Without it, though, it's, um, it's, it's almost suicidal. And so I hope that, that answers your question. Let's see what well, we've got more questions coming in. Well, that one's uh, intriguing. Let's go for this one. So I was intrigued to hear that it had been proposed for France and the UK to become one country with joint citizenship and surprised me as both countries seem quite patriotic. Do you think it could ever have been realised in practice? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think it could have been, sadly. Uh, we've got to remember from last week's talk the, um, the pamphlet in the interwar period from France suggesting that Britain be reduced to, to slavery to protect French interests. Certainly, the French soldiers fought very well against the British in 1941, when the British would start to invade French colonies. The French had been highly suspicious of, um, of the British. I recommend, if anybody's interested, reading uh, I think the historian James Barr has wrote uh, two very good books on the British and French struggle against each other in the Middle East, including the French plan to poison our current Queen Elizabeth II when she was a princess. In 1945, French military intelligence did consider attacking London with cholera to uh, to try and undermine British efforts against, as they perceived it, against the French Empire. So no, I'm, I don't think that there was a much of a realistic chance of joint citizenship for those two countries because of the, um, the depth of suspicion felt in the country uh, particularly the well, between Britain and between the two countries. But Churchill was desperate to do anything he could to offer Reynard an excuse to carry on the conflict, much like the Senate fighter squadrons. Uh, we can see that if France had carried on the war from its empire, the war would have been very different. I mean, with that French fleet able to help the British fleet, suddenly the British Empire in the East is a lot less vulnerable. The chance of Japan getting involved in the war becomes a lot less. Uh, the war might have stayed a European war instead of becoming a Pacific one with the access to that fleet. And um, with access to, to French imperial resources to help the British, uh, the British imperial resources, suddenly Britain's position is a lot stronger. And so the, uh, the war could certainly have been shorter against, uh, against Germany. The failure of the, um, the British to persuade the French to continue the struggle from their colonies until quite late in the war. I know the French are very proud of the, you know, the free French forces, and rightly so, and of French res the French resistance. The French resistance really only starts to be effective from 1944, maybe not early 1944, maybe, yes, or late 1943 onwards. At this stage of the war, uh, France is far more, the French uh, forces are far more likely to be fighting for the Germans against the British than they are to, uh, to be resisting German occupation. Uh, understandably, France is less keen to remember the, uh, that particular chapter in the Second World War. Let's see what else have we got. Ooh, let's go for this one. What have we got? So if Vichy France came to terms with Germany and refused to let their naval fleet leave or join the British, did they also put forward any ground forces into fighting alongside Germany? Did French forces ever fight against other French forces? Good question. Yes, French forces did fight against other French forces, uh, particularly in West Africa and uh, in Madagascar. The French did put an army into the field in Syria 
to fight against the British supported by German aircraft. The French, Vichy French also put an army into North Africa to fight against the British Americans and Free French in 1942. One thing was noticeable though was that, that uh, Vichy French forces were likely to surrender very quickly to Americans but to fight bitterly against the British and so the Allies tried to make sure that whenever there was fighting to be done against Vichy French units it was done by Americans because they were, le they were less likely to fight to the bitter end. Against the British they were convinced the British were trying to steal their empire and so particularly in Syria and so they were determined to fight to the finish. There are famous uh, examples of, um, of French aircraft bombing and strafing British convoys and even when taking prisoners saying uh, chanting at the British that uh, they thought the French couldn't fight and they'd proven them wrong and so yeah Vichy France becomes better and we do must remember that the British do antagonize Vichy France with their actions at Merse el Kabir in Iran destroying that French fleet. Uh, had, the, uh, had that French admiral made a different choice and sailed away to the Caribbean then Vichy France would probably have been far less hostile to us. As far as the Vichy French were concerned the British started it which certainly helped the narrative of perfidious Albion. Now, I've got eight more minutes and these questions keep on piling in. this one. So in 1940 French and British retreats held up by roads crowded ref with refugees. Do the Germans deliberately plan to use this advantages? It's not that they, so much that they deliberately planned that as an advantage, they deliberately planned to make sure that refugee columns weren't a disadvantage to them and they also planned to make sure that there were refugees on the road because the, the Germans behaviour moving through into the West was not kind and of course the people of Belgium had very un, uh, unhappy memories of German occupation and German massacres and uh, war crimes in 1914. So it's not, that the, it's not that the Germans are thinking that the refugees will necessarily lead to the British army and the French army being trapped in Belgium. They know that it will slow the British and French and they're determined that they won't be so themselves. Their main thought though is we won't be slowed as opposed to thinking about the other side of the hill. They are because they know that everything is on one gamble for speed. They will do they do anything that it takes to clear the roads for them. The fact that this happens to also clog the roads to the British and French because it reminds the, the it reminds the British and sorry the Belgians and French of the horrors of 1914 so similarly that it will also slow the British and French. That's that's more or less a happy accident. They're very focused upon their own movements, that they will clear the roads for them and then these actions do clog the roads to the British and French at the same time in what is a sort of, I suppose a bonus for the German army. Whether the French and uh, British could have turned round having gone into Belgium by the way, uh, probably not. The, uh, the key advance of the Germans is so rapid that the British and French are really caught by surprise and it does take a lot to turn an army around. It's not just a case of doing a three point turn with a truck and, and driving the other way. You know, there are armies that are in contact with the enemy and that's really what the, the German army in Belgium is, is, take, is seeking to achieve to make sure that the British and French can't escape Belgium because there is a German army in front of them and they don't dare turn their backs upon it for fear of what those Germans will do to them as they're pulling out. But uh, of course it, it does work brilliantly for them. Now I think that might have to be time for us. Some of these questions are a bit lengthy for me to, to read in the, the minutes that I have. But I hope you've all enjoyed joining us for our, for our latest talk for Avenue Museum. And fingers crossed I'll be able to join you all to carry on this story next Remembrance Day uh, in Abingdon in person. Certainly that would be you know, as nice as this is. I'm, I'm, I'm just facing here uh, a camera and a screen of lamps. I've taken all the lamps out of my house and there's a bright glare facing me. It's, I'd much rather be able to see all of your faces. So um, I hope that you all stay safe, uh, look after each other and I hope you, uh, you cope with lockdown and uh, if I don't see you before, have a Merry Christmas. Thank you. <laughs>